welcome to the Book Club Review. I'm Laura. I'm Kate. And this is the podcast about book clubs and the books that get you talking. 2020. It's been a weird year. Indeed. And it's hard to believe it's already August. And under normal circumstances, many of us will be carefully choosing the books to stuff into our suitcases, ready to read on the plane, at the beach, or lounging by the pool. Instead, this year is all about the staycation. A time to water the vegetables we planted in the spring, consolidate that sourdough knowledge, and, whenever possible, have a break from our children, even if it just means hiding from them at the bottom of the garden. And if we want to travel anywhere, it may just have to be through the books we read. So fear not, and keep listening. It's a summer reading special just for you. It's packed full of tried and tested recommendations, both from us and a few friends of the pod. The goal is to give you everything you need to find that perfect beach read even if you're nowhere near a beach. So set up that deck chair in the garden, possibly with an umbrella handy if you're in the UK, and settle in. Laura, you're actually off to the seaside later today, aren't you, with husband and baby and a carload of stuff. Are you going to manage to squeeze any books in? I know, I'm very, very lucky to be headed to the seaside. Yes, of course I'm going to have books to slot in. I don't have to worry about packing light because, of course, we're just going to be driving down to the coast. (laughs) Oh, I thought you meant you don't have to worry about packing light because you're taking a baby. (laughs) Well, that too. (laughs) Therefore, you basically need to take your whole house. Exactly. (laughs) It's actually quite easy packing for a baby because you just bring everything they might possibly need. Yeah. (laughs) But when it comes to books, I have got three that I'm going to be bringing with me. I mean, I'm only there for three days, but I always think it's best to have a choice when you go on holiday because you don't quite know what you'll feel like. So I'm taking The Vanishing Half by Britt Bennett. I don't know if you know this, but my book club is reading this. And I think yours is too. Oh, Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that, but that's great. So it'll be one of those episodes where we can report back on both of our book clubs and what they made of it. We could maybe get someone from your book club and someone from my book club to come along. All right, we can do it. Uh, Well, when we get there, that will probably be coming out in the autumn at some point. I'm also taking Natives, Race and Class in the Ruins of Empire, which sounds quite dull and also really challenging and it's the opposite I have started it but I put it to one side because I had to do book club reading but now I'm going to get back to it it is part memoir and part polemic by the hip-hop artist and poet Akala and it's about growing up mixed race in Camden in 1980s and 1990s Britain as well as being a history of black Britain it's super readable I do think they messed up with the title. I mean, Race and Class and the Ruins of Empire, that sounds like an essay you'd have to read in university, doesn't it? Mm, Or a dusty book you might come across in a secondhand bookshop. Yes, but I'm going to pick that up. I can report back on bookshelf. And then I'm also bringing The Meaning of Rice, A Culinary Tour of Japan, which will tick the arm seat traveling box. And I feel with that one, they very much did get the title right. That's a great title. Yeah. So (laughs) those are my three. We'll have to see which one actually becomes my beach read. It'll depend on what I feel like. Yeah, it's a slightly artificial label, isn't it? Summer read or beach read. This idea that in summer we're only going to want to read a certain type of book. I mean, for me, it's true. I often get a bit more reading time in the summer. Like I I maybe prioritize it a bit more than I do the rest of the time, but I'm not necessarily reaching for different books. But maybe it's fair to say that we want something that's going to be good. You know, you don't want to waste your time, but at the same time, maybe we want something that's not going to be too demanding, something that's going to be light, something that's going to be entertaining. Well, it can go either way, can't it? Sometimes I actually want a book that's quite challenging, you know, that has classic status. I read Beloved in Croatia a few years back now, which was very worthwhile, but also not at all your typical summer read. Mm, Such a great book, though. Well, talking of classics, my classic that I venture to recommend, starting highbrow folks, is Anna Karenina by Leo Tolstoy. I did a buddy read with some people I met on Instagram through Charlie Turpey, who we interviewed about her London Archive Book Club. She invited me to join this group. And so I connected up with people in Australia. One was in New Zealand, some were here in the UK. And we did two parts of Anna Karenina a week. So that was about... I don't know, like 150 pages, something like that. And then we would get together over Instagram on Sunday mornings here to discuss it. It was really a kind of incredibly rewarding and life enhancing experience. It's not the first time I've read it. And I think for a lot of people, because it's such a classic book, a lot of people may have read it like I did when they were much younger. And I think it's really, really, really nice to come back to it. Or if you have never read it, then yes, goodness, now is the time. 
Anna Karenina, she is an aristocratic woman who seems to have everything. She has beauty, wealth, popularity and a much-loved son. But she feels that her life is empty until the moment that she meets the impetuous officer, very dashing Count Vronsky at a party. Their subsequent affair scandalises society and family alike and soon brings jealousy and bitterness in its wake. And then contrasting with this story is another story of Levin, who is a man striving to find contentment and a meaning to his life, who is a thinly disguised portrait of Tolstoy himself. The book's published by Penguin, who describe it as an epic novel of love, destiny and self-destruction. People think, I always say this, people think Tolstoy is going to be really heavy going, but he's really not. It's true, he has a lot to say about all his characters, but they just leap off the page and you so quickly become absorbed in them and their lives and you're eagerly turning the pages to find out what happens next. Plus, there are bits of this book that just, they're like a soap opera, you know, it's kind of like one (laughs) drama after another. (laughs) And it's just fun. It's really fun. It's got this extraordinary sense of place and time. And yet, at the same time, somehow, you wouldn't think that, you know, this sort of 19th century Russian author would have that much to say to us uh, today in our contemporary lives. But I think this is the reason that Tolstoy is so important is because he really does. His understanding of human nature is just, it feels like it's just unsurpassed. And if you read this, I think arguably it's a way to become a better, wiser human being. And if you can do all that from a sun lounger, then I think so much the better. (laughs) You are on a bit of a Tolstoy kick. This follows on from your reading of War and Peace. Yeah, that's right. Last summer I read War and Peace, which was... War and Peace actually is a book that I have come back to several times over the years. I kind of check in with it again every 10 years or so. Oh my God, that's, I'm so old. Um, <laughs> but so yeah, it's like it's like the third time around for me. It's really interesting to read it at different stages in my life. And because, of course, the things you then take from it change. That's what's so fascinating. If you're like me and you like to come back from holiday with a sense that you've achieved something, I mean, for me, that's one of the great pleasures of having time is to feel like I really used it in some way. If you do take me up on the suggestion, then I also am highly recommending a book called The Anna Karenina Fix, which regular listeners will have heard me mention before. It's by Viv Grosskopf. It makes for a really good companion read. It is a brilliantly entertaining guide to the great Russian writers and their works, and she's packaged it all up as a kind of take-home life advice book. It's very funny. It's also scholarly and it's wise, and I really loved it. She helped explain Tolstoy to me, and I think once you understand more about Tolstoy the man you read Anna Karenina slightly differently and it gives you an extra dimension, I think, to your understanding of that book. So yeah, I'm opening with that. I mean, hey, listeners, take up the challenge. I'm a bit embarrassed to admit I still haven't read any Tolstoy, despite your (laughs) proselytizing over the last two years. Well, you know, there's a short story of his called The Death of, I don't know how to pronounce it, The Death of Ivan Ilyevich, I think it is, that might be a way in perhaps for people who just don't have the time to wade through War and Peace or Anna Karenina. And I've been meaning to read that. So I might, I was thinking I might add that to my holiday reading bar. Mm, okay. All right. Maybe I'll start there. Well, I just quickly looked it up and The Guardian says it's one of the most lacerating works of literature ever written. A hard, pitiless stare into the abyss, not just of death, but of human nature. Maybe I'll just quietly take that off the summer reading pile. <laughs> I have a classic to recommend as well, although it's a much more recent classic. It is Hotel du Lac by Anita Bruckner which was published in 1984 and won the Booker that year, which is a little bit surprising only because it's such an understated novel that I think it would be very easy to underestimate it Mm. or to overlook it. Have you read this one? Yeah, I love Hotel du Lac. It's a beautiful novel, listeners, and it will transport you to the Swiss Alps, to a hotel on the edge of Lake Geneva, where Edith Hope has been exiled by her friends for a romantic misdemeanor. We don't know exactly what she did, although it will become clear as the novel progresses. But she's done something foolhardy in their eyes and they have packed her up and sent her to this hotel where actually you can only go if you have a recommendation. It's a family-run institution. And although the novel's set in the 1980s, you feel like you could be in a Henry James novel. You have an assorted cast of characters at the hotel, most of whom are women. It's the end of the season. There's kind of an ennui in the air. The locals are ready for all of these foreigners to kind of pack up and get out of there, have their own lives back and their own village back. And not much happens 
Edith herself is a novelist, a quite successful novelist of romantic novels. And she's supposed to be writing her next novel, but she's struggling. She's quite unhappy. You know, what's happened back in England has left her feeling quite bereft. And she's not sure what she should be doing with her life. She's a woman of a certain age. You get the feeling she's mid 30s, late 30s. I mean, like me, I would say. <laughs> so, gosh, I'm saying I'm, I'm of a certain age. Basically, she isn't married and that doesn't sit well with her friends. I should say, when I first read this book, I started it, got 10 pages in and I thought, oh, this is boring. And it's that kind of novel. If you're not in the mood for it, you won't appreciate it. So I would highly recommend this as a summer read, but only if you're in the mood for something quite contemplative, quite quiet. And yet it's much more than the sum of its parts. By the time I finished this book and closed the pages, I really had to sit with it for a few minutes because it felt like I'd read something quite profound. Yes, ennui is a very good word to use in describing that book, I think. But it's also very uh, sharply observed and very funny, isn't it? That's a good point. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's very, very dry. It does remind me of Henry James a lot, but updated for the 1980s. Well, speaking of romantic affairs, coming up, we've got our book club show on Rodham by Curtis Sittenfeld which we recorded the other day. That book has been a fixture on many a summer reading guide I've seen this year. Why do I mention that? Well, we were joined by our friend and journalist, Philip Chafee. And before he left, we asked him for his summer reading recommendations. Mm, I didn't get a chance to hear those. So do go on. I'm really keen to hear what Phil recommends. Well, firstly, I asked him if he thought he was going to be able to get away. It's to be figured out. I'm not entirely sure. I'm thinking Italy, but there's questions about whether I can go there as an American citizen. If I make it to a beach, if I were to do summer reading, I feel like I'm doing my summer reading rather than going on vacation. So, Okay, what are you recommending? Two books. One is, do you know Amitav Ghosh? The name is really familiar. I don't think so I've ever read He's an Indian him. author, novelist. He wrote one of my favorite books in the world is In an Antique Land, which he wrote decades ago. But he has this book called Sea of Poppies, which is the first of a trilogy, which is a historical fiction set in the like 1830s in India and Mauritius. But the trilogy ultimately gets to China and it sort of follows the British East India Company and the Opium War, but from not at all a British perspective. It's very Dickensian almost with characters from all different classes and parts of society. The trilogy is called the Ibis Trilogy, which is the Ibis is this ship which is carrying opium to China, but it's also carrying indentured servants from India to Mauritius. It's a former slave ship as well. So it's very scathing about the depravities and racism and brutality of the British Empire. But it's also just like a rollicking read and it's really fun and it's definitely a page turner. Like I sort of don't want to work all the time and just sit down and read this. My dad recommended it to me. He's read all of these books and I'm very much looking forward to having the whole trilogy to read. And the second recommendation is also slightly multi-books, but the main one is Highland Fling by Nancy Mitford. Do you know Nancy Mitford of the Mitford Sisters? I think I once read Love in a Cold Climate. Right. But I don't so remember it. That is her most, that one and also Pursuit of Love mm. are her most famous books from the late 40s. The Life um, and Loves of Wealthy Aristocrats. Is it set in Paris? Basically. I, I have not actually read those. Mm. So Highland Fling is her very first book from 1931. And Nancy Mitford, the Mitford Sisters were fairly upper class, but then one of them, Deborah became a duchess, and then one of them, um, what's her name, Diana married Oswald Mosley, the British fascist, yeah. and then Nancy was the writer, and um, I mean, others wrote books, but Nancy was the novelist, and her earlier ones, if you like P.G. Woodhouse, which I love, are very, very Woodhousean. They're just sort of buffoonish upper class people Highland Fling it's her up in this old pile somewhere in Scotland it's some friends aunt and uncle's place and they're in France for the summer so they're there but with other various aristocrats dropping in and they're all just completely ridiculous and the plot is sort of a Nancy Mickford type character who's in love with this guy called Albert which is very I mean this is just from Wikipedia I found this out um, he's modeled on this guy, Hamish St. Clair Erskine, <laughs> who was actually, Nancy Mitford was engaged to him, and he was 
basically completely gay and albert just the most flamboyant funny scathing character it's about absolutely nothing this book but it just flies by and there are still scenes from it that when i think about that make me laugh like it's just a completely delightful book her other early books there's also christmas pudding and wigs on the green these are all pre-war and they're all very wodehousey and very ridiculous wigs on the green <laughs> She actually took it out of print for most of her life because it's about British fascists and just making fun of them and so buffoonish. And Diana, her sister, was really wounded by her publishing this and mm. making fun of British fascists. And therefore, Nancy, it just was out of print for a long time, but you can get it now. So I recommend early Nancy Mitford. Great. That sounds brilliant. That sounds like just the sort of thing you want for your beach lounge. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. It would be great on the beach, and you can just sort of read a couple pages and laugh a bunch and then go swim. Have you ever read any Nancy Mitford? No, and it's such a strange omission in my reading life. She seems like the perfect writer for me. I have read the Amitav Ghosh novel, though, and agree with Phil that it would be a great summer read, a real rollicking historical novel. Well, there you go. One for the pile. Do you want to hear from another friend of the pod? Who have you got? So remember Emily's Walking Book Club of Hampstead Heath? Of course. Well, they're just starting up again after lockdown. Coming up in August, they're doing Effie Briest by Theodore Fontana. And then they're doing H is for Hawk by Helen MacDonald, which is a book I adore. Uh, that's coming up for them in September. I'll put the details in the show notes for anyone who's interested in finding out more or going along. But in the meantime, I asked Emily what she was recommending this summer. Hi Kate, hi Laura. So the summer reading that I would really recommend would be Middlemarch. I have loved rereading it very, very slowly over lockdown, which also coincided with having a new baby. While I didn't have that much time to read and also I felt my attention was very much taken over really by the news that was ever changing. I'd never check my news so often. This kind of languid prose and the completely different world were just such a balm to the fast-changing, frightening situation outside. And they really were a very welcome antidote to any anxiety I felt provoked by the coronavirus situation. Middle March is wonderfully long, so it would certainly engross you for a whole holiday and you probably have some left over for afterwards. But the chapters are so short that it's very easy to dip in and out of. Also, I expect many of us are having staycations this summer, and Middlemarch is a brilliant portrait of the English countryside and provincial life. The last thing I would say about Middlemarch is that I think it is so much about the importance of being kind to your fellow humans, believing in the good in people, and looking out for your neighbours. It is such a powerful argument for empathy, and Dorothea is an inspiration, especially in these times. I love Middlemarch. I feel about Middlemarch the way you feel about War and Peace. Oh, no, I also love Middlemarch. I feel the same okay. about Middlemarch <laughs> as I do about War. I love, I always say, George Eliot's one of those writers when you read her, and I think Tolstoy's in this category as well, but, you know, when you read her, you just think, why would you read anything else? You know, it's so good. And Middlemarch is such a page turner. I breezed through that. I mean, it took me probably three, four weeks, but still I wanted to pick it up. I was desperate to find out what was going to happen. Plus, it actually has a grand tour of Italy when Dorothea heads over there, which is, you know, will transport you in these times of staying at home. Yes, and that idea of empathy and our relationship with others brings me on nicely to my contemporary recommendation, which is Humankind, A Hopeful History by Rutger Bregman, billed instantly on Amazon as the most uplifting summer read of 2020. One of the things that might have surprised you about lockdown was how nice people were to each other. So in my street here, we quickly shared emails and everyone connected up in a way that we hadn't been connected before. And some people were shopping for other people who were older. Maybe they were shielding and they couldn't go. There were little exchanges of things when people needed things. And it was very nice and happily it's continuing on. And I think we all really appreciate it. So Humankind was the book that my book club read most recently, and it was such a great discussion book. But so he takes as his central argument that it's realistic, as well as revolutionary, to assume that people are, in their essence, good. So we have this idea, don't we, about humanity. I can remember at the beginning of lockdown, worrying about being in London, worrying about food supplies. And I remember saying to my husband, it's going to be awful. People are going to be fighting over food and, and then they'll come and they'll break down the door and they'll eat our children. <laughs> it's good you were calm. 
you know why I worry about these things? It's because I've read The Road. Have you read The Road by Cormac McCarthy? No, but I've read Station Eleven by Emily St. John Mandel. Well, I've read that too, bits of it. And, and I mean, that's, that's nothing compared to the kind of post-apocalyptic scenario that Cormac McCarthy paints. But the thing is, where do we get this idea from? Where do we get this idea that in extremist humanity, we will just turn on each other? And Bregman argues that, in fact, when you look at how people behave, in a crisis situation. In reality, they tend to behave altruistically. They tend to look out for one another. They tend to behave with kindness and empathy and that this is in fact our most essential nature. It's a really interesting book. It's very provocative. It's entertaining. It's the kind of book where it really unsettles your ideas about things and you immediately want to talk about it with people. He does a great debunking, for example, of Lord of the Flies. Again, a kind of a key text that many of us encounter in our teens, very impressionable. And we read this story about these boys that go to this island and in the absence of any civilization or structure, they kind of devolve into these feral, power-hungry creatures who prey on weakness. And he really unpicks William Golding and his history and the reasons why he might have had such a view of human nature when in fact the evidence is not there to support that. And then brilliantly, he goes off and finds a real life example of some boys that were marooned on an island. And it turned out that they actually behave very nicely. It's a really great one for evening conversations with your friends, family, the neighbours over the garden fence. It's a great read. In my book club, people were recommending the audio book, possibly slightly over the written version, because it's true that his style is it's almost better suited to a lecture than a reading experience. And so if you want something to invigorate and stimulate you, then this is the book. It sounds perfect, especially if you are one for a long summer walk. You could pop on your audiobook, go retreat to the fields, to the beach, to, well, to gardening. Actually, that's a really good point. Audiobooks are excellent if you're doing some gardening in the backyard. Yes, and good audiobooks are, you know, not all books work so well, do they, on audio? But I think the good ones, you know, this would be a great one. And, you know, I think this is a real moment where actually it is really heartening and reassuring to read a book about kindness. It's called A Hopeful History. That is the subtitle. And it does give you this sense that actually all is not lost. We have this enormous capacity for change and we have this enormous capacity for good. And sometimes, especially when the news is so bleak, it can be really good to focus on that for a little bit and consider that. That's what I loved about this. Good to have a nonfiction recommendation in there too, because I'm just recommending fiction myself. But it is probably on people's radar. Yes, that's true. It's been a massive bestseller. <laughs> <laughs> so I think you might have a recommendation no one will have ever heard of. Oh, I do. Yes. I asked Simon Thomas, who we interviewed about his Book of the Year book club. He does a podcast called Tea or Books, and he specializes in digging out sort of forgotten gems from the past. So when I asked him for a recommendation, he did not disappoint me. My choice of a summer read is called Business as Usual by Jane Oliver and Anne Stafford. It's from 1933, but it was recently rediscovered and republished by Handheld Press. Uh, I was really excited to read it when I learned that it was a novel in letters about a woman who works in the book section of a department store, a thinly disguised Selfridges. If that excites you too, it's every bit as good as it sounds. She's there for a year from Edinburgh as she prepares to get married. She wants to work for a year before she gets married to her fiancé, Basil. The entire novel is in her letters to different people. It's very funny. It's very charming. It's a fascinating look into that lost world. And I think it would be the perfect compliment for any summer holiday. I love Simon's recommendations. They always sound so great. Mm. I love a bit of 1930s nostalgia too. Just as an aside, that reminds me of my lockdown speed read, which was a birthday gift from you. That was The Bookshop on the Shore by Jenny Colgan. Oh, Have was you it ever good? read Jenny Colgan? I mean, you gave me that novel, but had you ever read her? I haven't ever read any of her adult books, but she's written a really lovely series for children called Polly and the Puffin children's books it's like you end up reading a lot of books to your children and so the good ones actually you really notice them when they come along and I realized quite early on that the Polly and the Puffin series were actually really good they're really fun to read so um, I know her through that but obviously she's a huge bestseller author I sort of assumed that she would be good 
yeah, she's incredibly popular and she puts out a book, I'd say, every year. And as you might assume from the title of this one, The Bookshop on the Shore, they often tend to have a bit of wish fulfillment. Often there's a romance. So it's easy to turn your nose up at that. But I was super impressed by her writing. This novel is about a struggling single mother who leaves London to run a mobile bookshop in the Scottish Highlands. Great premise. You think, oh, this is going to be super light, easy reading. And it was, but there were also darker themes and like the portrait of the poverty that this mother was living in in London rang really true. So yeah, total aside, but yes, The Bookshop on the Shore by Jenny Colgan, another recommendation. It's great fun. It's easy reading. I highly recommend it. Have you read, just as another aside to your aside, have you ever read The Bookshop by Penelope Fitzgerald? I have not. That's so good. Really good. And again, idea of um, this woman who goes to this little town and she sets up this bookshop. And the thing is, the town really didn't want the bookshop. And she tries very hard to make it work. And just the characters, the people that she meets and this this, this shop, the, even the premises itself, it's haunted. There's a ghost and it's very funny. It's very dry. It's kind of poignant at the end. But that also I really recommend as a summer read. It's great. And then that makes me think of our interview with Francesca Wilkins, who founded the Margate Bookshop. Is this an aside to my side to your side? Yes. Yeah, we interviewed <laughs> Francesca listeners on episode 47, if you want to check that out. And, you know, be inspired by a real life individual starting up a bookshop in a seaside town. Yeah, she is living the dream. She really is. But you have an official recommendation, don't you? I have an contemporary. Yes. yes. Back to business. Mm-hmm. I have an official contemporary recommendation. And actually, I reckon... of our listeners have already read this book, but it is just the perfect summer book. I read it last year next to the pool in Provence, and I was just so pleased with myself. I was just so happy that I had picked it up. So I don't think anyone should miss it. It is The Seven Deaths of Evelyn Hardcastle by Stuart Turton. Or if you're in the US, apparently it's The Seven and a Half Deaths for some reason, but never mind that. Have you heard of this one? I mean, it was everywhere a couple of years ago. I have a copy of it upstairs that I've never got round to reading. Well, it is great. I haven't come up with this description, but I think it's really apt. It's been described as Agatha Christie meets inception meets gosford park i would add to that it is almost like a computer game in a way almost a choose your own adventure although there's no real choice in the matter to get specific it is a murder mystery essentially but our protagonist wakes up in the body of a different individual in this stately home and relives the same day over and over from a different perspective Mm. um and When we first encounter him, he has absolutely no memory of what he is doing there. He knows that this isn't his body, but why is he in the forest? And why is he shouting Anna? And can hear a woman screaming in the distance. And then it's only as he goes through that day, and then when the day ends, wakes up in the body of another person in this stately home, that the picture begins to coalesce. And it becomes clear that he is fated to relive this day over and over again until he solves the death, the murder of Evelyn Hardcastle, who at the end of the night, at the end of the revelries that are occurring at this stately home, will be killed. And if he doesn't solve it after inhabiting, I think it's seven individuals. You would assume, wouldn't you, from the title? (laughs) I think so. If he doesn't solve it, then his memory will be wiped and he'll have to start again. Oh. Exactly. Do you think, though, do you have to, like... Agatha Christie style crime novels in order to yeah. enjoy this because Who you know doesn't? if like me you didn't really like those really? books do you not would you no I just find them a bit I just I always say this I find the drip 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 of information really boring mm. and I suppose my mind doesn't work in that way that I enjoy fitting together the pieces of the puzzle to figure it out myself I'm really not that interested I want the book to tell me <laughs> <laughs> well, but actually then this might work well for you because you are on a journey with Aiden Hill mm. as he moves through these people's bodies mm-hmm. and sees things from different perspectives. So it's not like Agatha Christie's Miss Marple at the end explaining yes. what's happened. Yeah. It's him trying to work out what's happened and the picture becoming clearer and clearer as he sees things from different perspectives. Yeah. Well, it sounds, so you might like it. It sounds really inventive anyway. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'll, I'll dust it off, shall I? I'll fish it out. I know exactly also, where it is. <laughs> it's also really long, and that could be seen as a bad thing, but I like to have a big, chunky book. You know, it's 500 pages of whodunit, mm. and it's in a beautiful stately home in the middle of an estate. You've got the upstairs, downstairs thing going on. 
Our protagonist is at risk of being murdered by a psychopathic footman. I mean, what's that about? It's really good. It, it actually won the... Uh, Some kind of dagger award. It actually won the best first novel in the 2018 Costa Book Awards. All right. So yes. So, you know, this isn't a fly beneath the radar recommendation at all. Mm. But it is the complete opposite to Hotel du Lac. And therefore, I leave it to listeners to kind of choose what they feel like. Well, we've got one more to end with, and that comes from Elizabeth Morris, who writes the brilliant monthly newsletter Crib Notes with book recommendations for new and busy mothers. And we're definitely in both of those categories, aren't we? Yes, quite. Although I do think her recommendations will be brilliant for anyone who reads. Yeah. Yes, exactly. New and busy mothers and readers. <laughs> yeah, full stop. We interviewed Elizabeth back on episode 64, and she flagged up so many interesting reads. What is she recommending for the summer? The book that I recommend reading this summer is Bernadine Evaristo's Blonde Roots, which has just been reissued by Penguin. Blonde Roots imagines a topsy-turvy counter-history of the slave trade, in which Europe is colonised by Africa. It's riotously inventive, brimming with tongue-in-cheek humour, and simultaneously offers up a biting commentary on the roots of modern-day racism. It's a hugely entertaining read, and it's a timely one too. With Everisto looking likely to win the 2020 Women's Prize for Fiction, having won the Booker Prize in 2019 with Girl, Woman, Other, it is a great time to explore her vibrant back catalogue. My shameful secret, Laura, which you might know, actually, is that I haven't got around to reading Girl, Woman, Other. It's up there with my cultural shame about never having seen a full episode of Fleabag. Well, I share your cultural shame about never having seen a full episode of Fleabag. Um, <laughs> There's a reason we make this podcast together, isn't there? Yeah. <laughs> We're I more so. kindred spirits than I realise. But you're going to have to read Girl, Woman, Other because it was the book read most recently by my book club. Yes, well, so I was going to take it with me to uh, to read it this summer. But then, with Elizabeth's recommendations, I kind of thought, oh, because the premise of Blonde Roots sounds amazing. Yeah, it really does. So, do we have enough for our summer reading piles? Do we have enough options? I think so. I think the key thing is to have options. So when you arrive on holiday, whether that's a physical arrival or perhaps more of a, a metaphysical mental arrival, you're able to read what you want to read. For me, that's what summer reading is all about. There should be no should. It should be just, I feel like reading this, so I'm going to read it. Mm. You can follow your impulses. Yeah, I always take my Kindle as well, just in case I feel like going rogue yeah, so do I. and reading something <laughs> entirely different. <laughs> Well, you will find all of those recommendations, plus links to Emily's Walking Book Club, Simon's Teal Books podcast, and Elizabeth's script notes in our show notes. And hey, it's not quite over yet, because we have a few more recommendations from our Instagram friends. For a classic, Cindy Freed loves Anthony Trollope. There are plenty of options with 47 novels to choose from. Why not try Barchester Towers to start, with great characters and lots of humour? Cindy also recommends The Godmother by Anne Lorquer which won the European Crime Fiction Prize and the French Grand Prix de Littérature Policière. The Godmother is a fiery, funny and startlingly original tale from the banlieues of Paris. When Patience, a hard-working French-Arabic police translator and long-standing witness to the ubiquitous racism and repression of the system, is let go without a pension or reward for her 25 years of service, there's only one thing to do. Change sides. And Cindy also recommends The Truants by Kate Weinberg which Red Magazine described as the secret history meets Agatha Christie. Jess Walker, middle child of a middle-class family, has perfected the art of vanishing in plain sight. But when she arrives at a concrete university campus under flat grey East Anglian skies, her world flares with colour. Drawn into a tightly knit group of rule breakers, led by their maverick teacher Lorna Clay, Jess begins to experiment with a new version of herself. But the dynamic between the friends begins to darken as they share secrets, lovers, and finally a tragedy. Soon, Jess is thrown up against the question she fears most. What is the true cost of an extraordinary life? Frida Parker-Leanne recommends A Paragon by Colin McCann, which The Guardian called a beautifully observed masterpiece. Based on the true-life friendship of two men whose daughters were killed in the Middle East, this novel buoys the heart. Frida thinks a holiday is the perfect time to give this book the attention it deserves and found it a profoundly hopeful read, despite the upsetting subject matter. She said she couldn't wait to come back to it each day. 
And Stephanie Somerville got in touch to recommend The Most Fun We Ever Had by Claire Lombard, which has been long-listed for the 2020 Women's Prize. It's a modern-day sweeping family saga filled with drama, mystery and intrigue, and Stephanie loved it for its take on sister and mother-daughter relationships. And finally, Jess at the London Book Reader recommends Francis Char's debut novel, If I Had Your Face, which plunges us into the mesmerising world of contemporary soul, a place where extreme plastic surgery is as routine as getting a haircut, where women compete for spots in secret room salons to entertain wealthy businessmen after hours, where K-pop stars are the object of all-consuming obsession, and ruthless social hierarchies dictate your every move. This is the story of four young women who are navigating this hyper-competitive city. That's all for this episode. You can drop us a line on email at thebookclubreview at gmail.com or keep in touch through Instagram and Facebook at Book Club Review Podcast or on Twitter at Book Club RVW Pod. And let us know what you're reading this summer. Please do get in touch. And listeners, we hope that whatever you're doing, wherever you are, summer 2020 is a good one. Stay safe. Thanks for listening and happy reading. <laughs>